So what makes a great TED Talk it is a super important question that unfortunately has no answer. There's no formula, there's no single formula for a TED Talk, there's no shortcut, there's no silver bullet, there's no one-size-fits-all strategy. I think you all already know that. The truth is every TED Talk has to be crafted from the ground up to really authentically represent a speaker's idea and their personality. But over the years, we have found that there are certain factors that um, describe almost all great TED Talks, and we have found ways to both identify and articulate those factors, and I wanted to share some of them with you today. And what I want to do is do that through the lens of the almost, sort of the near misses, the TEDx talks that almost made TED.com, the talks that we love but lacked one critical factor that kept them um, from quite getting there. And this, um, it might sound flip, but this is actually a really important lens because every time there's a talk we love that doesn't quite make TED.com, it honestly breaks our heart because we see the potential. But each time it happens, it also teaches us something about um, how to better train speakers to give a talk that truly represents their idea and truly meets its potential. So, what makes a great TED Talk? The first thing will seem obvious, which is that all great TED Talks have an idea at their center. That seems obvious, but the way that plays out in actuality, it can be really subtle. And the number one reason that a talk uh, that we otherwise really like does not quite make TED.com is because it lacks a clear idea uh, in the middle of it. So one of the ways this plays out is in this concept right here, which is that a TED Talk is idea-centered. It's not just a personal story. And this is probably the number one factor we see among TEDx talks that we love that weren't quite right for TED.com. Talks that you might describe as a story, a story of self, somebody who is telling you their life story. And often these, these talks are so compelling. They're popular, they're smart, they're meaningful. They provide this really interesting lens on local culture. But if a story about yourself is not wrapped in an idea, then it's it's just a biography. It's not quite a TED Talk. And so let me show you one example. This is um, Ali Taleb Amorani from TEDx Sana. في 2004 واحد من أقاربي أخذني المسجد. قال لي يا علي حتوقف هنا حتشحت معك تقييرك الطبي وأي مبلغ حيطلع حنقسمه بالنص. في 2008 كنت أصغر مدير تحرير لأهم برنامج يومي في المملكة العربية السعودية. And he gave this incredible passionate story about the transformation of his life. But the problem was that he never actually articulated an idea around it. He told us the facts of his life, but he didn't give us the takeaway message. And this is something that comes up very frequently, both for us in the conference and for all of you with your events. And there is, can be a somewhat similar, a simple solution, which is to encourage people who, when they come to speak, not just to tell their life story, but to extract meaning from it, to try to figure out what is the biggest lesson of their life. Life? Is it to um, overcome obstacles at all costs? Is it to not believe what other people uh, assume about you? Is it to um, see the, what you lack as an opportunity? There are these, of course, sound a bit like cliches, and it's actually okay that these aren't the most original ideas, but an um, idea you've heard before wrapped in a story that you haven't can be incredibly compelling. I wanted to give you two counterexamples of talks that did work perfectly. So Amy Purdy talking at TEDx Orange Coast, it's a talk to go watch where she's telling telling the life story of um, becoming paralyzed, I believe, from the uh, knees down and how she overcame that and continued. She's a professional snowboarder. She was also on Dancing with the Stars, one of the dancing shows in the U.S., I think, Dancing with the Stars. Or so you think you can dance? Somebody here knows. Stella Young, I'm not your inspiration. Thank you very much for rejecting the idea that because she's disabled and she's speaking to you that she called it inspiration porn. She's like, I'm not your inspiration porn. Um, another example, this was a talk from Ted Yu, uh, our, you know, the attendee stage at Ted Global. And this was a talk, a young couple whose childhood had a stroke at birth. And we, uh, Kelly and I actually curated this Ted Yu, and we put them on the stage 
stage, not thinking that this talk would make TED.com, because making TED.com is not the end all and be all. Sometimes you just want talks that are for the room, that are just uh, introduce people to the audience. And that's what we actually thought this talk was. It was a wonderful personal story about this couple from Italy. But in the end, actually, the talk really worked. They had this beautiful way of thinking about you know, their son's illness, of seeing what he had not as a lack, but as an opportunity. Again, it may sound like a cliche, but it came across with such authenticity and was incredibly moving. So the next thing that makes a great TED Talk, or the next way to think about um, ideas in a TED Talk, is that a TED Talk is not just a lecture. Now, this is another concept that can be a little bit tricky to describe. It's hard to describe the difference between a lecture and a TED Talk, but I think of it this way. A lecture um, just delivers facts. It delivers a series of facts that teaches you something, whereas a TED Talk has an idea at its center. We see this quite frequently. There are talks that deliver like really interesting interesting series of facts, but they just don't quite add up to an idea. And let me give you an example. Um, it's actually my favorite example of this because I love this talk. Um, this is uh, Christopher Gaze, the head of the Shakespeare Festival in Vancouver. Shakespeare surrounds us. In Shakespeare we're enormously familiar with, but the Shakespeare that we know and we don't know and of course, every day, we're quoting Shakespeare, but we don't know it. Ah, I, th I see, I love this talk so much, I'm like, go on. <laughs> because that's the kind of talk it is, right? He's, he's brilliant, he, he is so articulate, he's so eloquent, he has a great British accent, he clearly knows his stuff, he is passionate, and he, um, but the problem was he told us all of these things about Shakespeare. He gives us all of these quotes from Shakespeare that still pervade us. He told us things about Shakespeare's life we didn't know, but he never actually articulated an idea. And what was frustrating is I knew that he had ideas, but he just sort of hinted at them, but he never articulated them. And so it came out as a series of facts that were just wonderful to listen to, but didn't have a center. And so what he could have done is just add that, uh, just a framework at the beginning that said something like, um, uh, like no one else before or after, Shakespeare gave us the language to understand our modern human experience. That is why we still quote him. That's why he's still relevant today. That's all that talk needed to bridge it from a lecture into a TED Talk. I want a do-over on that one. All of these talks, actually, I really want do-overs on. So um, one great counterexample to go watch is this talk by Parul Segal on uh, TED.com. And her talk, like Christopher's, is very much a, a love letter to literature. Really, what she's talking about is, is books and authors that she loves. But she does it through this lens of, of envy. And what she says is that envy is the, the least understood human emotion and uh, one that we, sh we shun, and that the only the only way to properly understand it is not through psychology, but actually through literature. And that gave her the framework to kind of delve into literature in really beautiful ways. So now here is another really challenging aspect of the centeredness of TED Talks that comes up quite often. A TED Talk is about an idea and not an issue. Now, so many TED speakers are oriented toward social change. And this is one of the things we really embrace, right? TED speakers are people who see a problem in the world and they set out to correct it. They want to um, uh, inform you about it and change the, your mind about it. They want to change the world around it. But there is a difference between an idea-based talk and an issue-based talk. And idea-based talks, they're energizing and captivating and they kind of awaken you to a world of possibilities. And issue-based talks are, can be exhausting because they hammer you with problems without providing a solution. So there are three ways to think about this. One is that an issue exposes a problem and an idea proposes a solution. They're flips of the same thing. Almost every time you have an issue-based talk, you can flip it into an idea-based talk just by changing its perspective. Another way to think about it is that an issue-based talk leads with morality, this is wrong. An idea-based talk leads with curiosity. Another way to think about that, an issue says, isn't this terrible? And an idea says, isn't this interesting? And almost every issue-based talk can be flipped. And I want to show you actually a positive example on this front. So I'm going to show you a clip from a talk by Julian Treasure. He's given around five TED Talks, all of them actually on the attendee stage at TED Global. And he's an expert in sound. And he approached us with an idea that we found very intriguing. 
but he was approaching it originally from the standpoint of an issue. He said, we have a real problem in the UK and around the world because our buildings are designed to look good, but nobody can hear in them. And this is a huge problem because schools are being designed in ways that kids can't hear in class. Hospitals are designed in ways that uh, patients can't heal. It is, a, it is a big problem. And what we said to him is like, that is a great idea, but you, you just have to flip it into a challenge, into a proposal, into a solution. And so this is the beginning of the resulting talk. It's time to start designing for our ears. Architects and designers tend to focus exclusively on these. They use these to design with and they design for them, which is why we end up sitting in restaurants that look like this and sound like this, shouting from a foot away to try and be heard by our dinner companion. Or why we get on aeroplanes, which cost 200 million pounds, with somebody talking through an old-fashioned telephone handset on a cheap stereo system, making us jump out of our skins. We're designing environments that make us crazy. And it's not just our quality of life which suffers. It's our health, our social behavior, and our productivity as well. So it went from a talk that may have immediately made people tune out to one that immediately tunes you in. It gives you a, a proposal, an idea. Why don't we design with our ears? It, it uh, makes it very relevant to you. Instead of diving straight into hospitals and schools, he begins with restaurants and planes, things you can relate to, and then bridges it to the broader social problem while making you laugh a little bit along the way. So it was the perfect way to get his idea across. And his idea has actually been picked up very widely since this talk, but doing it in a way that the audience can hear. Now, there are a few interesting interesting um, exceptions to this. So I want to um, point out this talk by, um, beautiful talk actually, by Lisa Christine. This was from TEDx Maui, I believe, TEDx Maui. This talk, uh, uh, Lisa Christine is a, a photographer, a brilliant photographer who does these gorgeous photographs um, documenting modern slavery. She does not have a solution to modern slavery, but her photographs bear witness um, through her art in a beautiful way to a challenge in the world. And so, you know, curation is always subjective, right? We could have decided that this was too much of an issue-based talk and we weren't going to put it on TED.com, but we decided actually this talk is a really beautiful and moving tribute to a challenge that we may not have a solution to yet, but it is a, it's a, um, a her photographs might inspire a solution. So I bring to show you that this uh, curation isn't a Either or, it's not uh, objective, it's subjective. And this is also a beautiful talk that you should take a look at. So the next challenge we see in many talks is, um, or actually another definition of a great TED talk, is that it has a clear articulation of the idea. And this is another one of these challenges we see over and over again, especially in newer speakers, but um, in speakers across the board, which is that oftentimes um, speakers will deliver an entire talk, but they'll never actually quite say what they're saying. They'll, s they'll talk around it, they'll, 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 they'll speak in different directions, but they'll never quite articulate what they do, or they'll never quite articulate their mission, or they'll never quite articulate the idea at the center. Now, one of the reasons that they don't do this is because it is actually hard. And it's particularly hard when it's your own work. People sometimes actually don't know how to articulate their own idea. This is particularly common among artists when uh, presenting their work. Um, they don't have a single sentence to encompass what they do. Sometimes it's easier for someone else to look in and tell them uh, how to describe their art, but it sometimes happens with scientists as well, business people, it happens across the board. And so what I wanna share you, with you here is one um, near miss. This is a talk that um, I loved and had such great hopes for. It's by um, Lori Marker, who is a world-renowned scientist. She studies cheetahs. And I've actually followed her work for um, years. I find her incredibly inspiring. And so when I saw this talk, which I believe was at TEDx Portland, I was so excited to see it because she is a voice that we really want on TED.com. But um, Lori, like many, many scientists and many people, she gave a talk that um, was very wide-ranging. She wanted to tell us about many different things, both her work on cheetahs and uh, her work more local area, the, the winery she's developed, and so it was a very wide-ranging talk. But more importantly, she never took the time to quite pull together that clear articulation at the beginning of, of what she did, why cheetahs are important, why she wants to save them. Um, so let me just show you a clip from the talk. I didn't start out to become who I am today. I met a cheetah, it changed my life. <laughs> Meeting a cheetah, falling in love with a cheetah, gave me a mission, um, and it's given me a focus. And you may have noticed in that video that we were watching early on that the body of the cheetah, it was moving and the tail was moving, 
but the eyes were fixed, the face was fixed directly on what, um, what it was going after, its target. With laser focus, nothing else matters. And that's what's made the cheetah a successful predator. And it's that kind of focus that's allowed me to do exactly what I've done. So you see how she almost got there. And this is the kind of thing we see in speakers all the time when they know where they want to go and they just have to go that extra mile to articulate that core part of their work. And as you're listening to this, right, you want to pull it out of her. You're like, I see what your work is about, Lori. Like, you saw a cheetah, you fell in love with its intensity and focus, and you have spent your career trying to have that same intensity and focus in preserving this majestic creature, right? That's what you wanted her to say so that we could then follow along. And that's the kind of, um, really, an intervention you can make with a speaker. If just at the top of the top, <laughs> that was funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is an intervention of saying, like, I see what you want to articulate there and help them to pull together often just one or two sentences at the top of the talk that clearly articulate their mission. Now, let me show you a case in which this really worked. So this next clip is also from a, uh, a, a biologist, my, my colleague Tom Riley would call both of these speakers, obsessive speciologists, people who just love a single animal and want to share with you their, their, their fascination with this animal. We love these talks. So um, this next one was filmed at um, our TED audition um, in Nairobi, I believe, with the help of the organizers of um, uh, TEDx Nairobi. So let's take a look at this one and compare. I would like to talk to you about a very special group of animals. There are 10,000 species of birds in the world. Vultures are amongst the most threatened group of birds. When you see a vulture like this, the first thing that comes to your mind is these are disgusting, ugly, greedy creatures that are just after your flesh, associated with politicians. <laughs> I want to change that perception. I want to change those feelings you have for these birds, because they need our sympathy. They really do. And I'll tell you why. Right? You want to hear what he's about to say. Because he is like crystal clear and persuasive, and he pulls you, and he knows. You know, even, even if you are not at all interested in vultures, and let's face it, I'm, I actually can almost bet that there is no one in this room that was interested in vultures 30 seconds ago, but now you kind of want to know. And he really put that time in the beginning to persuade you and pull you in. Now, the interesting thing is, too, this speaker, as you, as you might imagine, remains quite focused on, on target throughout his talk. But if a speaker is super targeted and focused like this at the beginning of the talk, everything else can be forgiven. Like, they can wander, they can be their own selves, they can go off on some tangents. But as long as people know from the beginning what journey they're going on, they're really bought into taking that journey. Um, so it, another thing to think about there is thinking about the very beginning of a talk and how it pulls you in. And so that's what we're going to get to next. Now, the next aspect of a great TED Talk is that it is focused. This is a challenge that many of you work on with your speakers all the time. TED Talks are short, 18 minutes at most. It is enough time for a single idea and sometimes only half an idea. It, you cannot pack more than one idea into a talk. And for many speakers, this is painful because there's so much that they want to convey. There's so much that they want to tell you about their work. And one technique that I found over time is that it is really useful um, to frame it up for speakers as one of the many TED Talks they'll give in their life. This is your first TED Talk. You have other TED Talks. This piece of your talk belongs in a different one. So here is an example of a, um, a near miss. Um, a talk that begins a bit too broad. I want to tell you a story. A story that begins four and a half billion years ago. The creation of this planet called Earth. About a billion years goes by until the first signs of life start swimming around in the primordial oceans. A few more billion years go by till 50,000 years ago the first modern humans start walking around this amazing planet. Something really interesting happens about 38,000 years ago. OK, so this was actually a talk on big data. <laughs> and, that, and that is funny, but I say that with love and respect because it is actually a very good talk. But it starts to broad. And actually, this particular trend is one that we fight all the time. Speakers often want to begin with the beginning of the universe, but you don't have time <laughs> in a TED talk. So even it took them quite a while to get to 50,000 years ago, but 
big data is like 50 years ago. So the, the point is trying to bring them in. And the truth is like, you know, if you have 45 minutes, start at the beginning of the universe because there is a thread to be drawn there. But with a TED Talk, you have to get with laser focus into exactly what it is you want to tell people about and from the beginning bring them into that journey. So an overly broad beginning is a common mistake. Another way that this plays out is in speakers who give a talk on many, like sort of overviews, many, many different aspects of their field. And then in the last two minutes of the talk, they tell you something new. And you're like, God, why didn't you give the talk on that? That, that's the talk. I knew everything else. So that's another thing to watch for in your speakers when they're trying to give you all the background in their subject area before they get to the thing that's new. The thing that's new is often the thing that should be the TED Talk in itself. So finally, um, one more aspect of a great TED Talk. A great TED Talk starts strong. Now, we made the decision from the time we first put TED Talks online that we would intentionally make TED Talks start strong. So I think many of you know this. We do edit the talks that go online. And one of the things we do deliberately is that we often cut out the speaker's own introduction. So if they come up to stage and they say, like I did at the beginning of this, I was like, thank you, Jay, lovely introduction. And sometimes they're like, great lunch. What about that chicken? That previous speaker was so great. It's wonderful to be here. It's fine in the room. It makes the speaker feel comfortable. It makes you feel comfortable with them. But it is completely boring online. We cut all of that out, including sometimes their opening jokes so that the talk online begins at the moment they really begin and it pulls you in and it does not let you go. And the reason we do that is that online viewers are just exquisitely vulnerable to distraction. If you give them the slightest chance to do something different, they'll just they'll start reading an email or they'll start a web search and they don't mean to, but they're just gone. They're distracted and they leave. So you need to pull them in right away. So I want to give you two examples. One first of a near miss of a talk where um, the speaker, who is a great speaker, he has a talk on TED.com, just didn't focus on the introduction to his talk. Hi. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about why happiness is a serious issue. In fact, why I think it's probably the most serious issue. Uh, I was quite excited to be coming to your city, home of Barcelona. Uh, I didn't put a picture up of Messi today because I thought maybe... <laughs> But I was remembering your Olympics, and, and it's obviously a few years ago, but I remember these amazing images of these divers over the city and, uh, and, and a few other things from the Barcelona Olympics. And, of course, we in London, in my city, we, we had the Olympics uh, last year. And to be honest, most Brits were dreading it. So that is Nick Marks. He is incredible. He has a great talk on the happy in happiness index on TED.com, but he was just warming up the crowd. Two things to think about here. One is to encourage your speakers to think of it at the beginning of their talks. And the second is, you know, you can edit that out. Just so you know, when you put up TEDx talks, you also can edit out the beginning and help them and start those talks at the moment when they really take off. Let me give you a great counterexample. This is um, Scylla Elworthy, an extraordinary woman, talking about nonviolence at TEDx Exeter. In half a century of trying to help prevent wars, there's one question that never leaves me. How do we deal with extreme violence without using force in return? Right. So she just pulls you in quietly in her own way. And the second you watch those first five sentences, you, you, you cannot not watch the rest of that talk. That's the power of a great beginning and a great focused beginning that lets the audience know exactly where they're going to be taken in the talk. So these are a few of the factors we think about when we think about what makes a great TED Talk. And the last one I want to leave you with is this. Um, great TED Talks are authentic. As I said before, there is, there's no formula. There's no silver bullet. There is no... Uh, uh, a cookie cutter approach that will create a great TED Talk. Great TED Talks are truly authentic to the person giving them, to their personality, to the pace of their speech, to their idea. And that is the challenge of working with each individual speaker, not to apply a formula to them, but to help them to craft up from, uh, uh, from their roots an authentic talk that feels right to them. So you can listen to these factors and think about them, but at the end of the day, it's to truly bring out what is true in a speaker and idea on the stage. 
These are some of the things we've learned along the way about what makes a great TED Talk. I know that many of you have learned many things that we can learn from, and really welcome that both today and over time. Great, Wonderful. thank you. Good job.